All right, good morning, everyone. I see we have um, quite a few people trickling on in. So we'll just give it a moment or two as we let people come on in. If you uh, would like to put in the chat where you are joining us from, I know we would appreciate it. And I will share that I am in Woodland, California. I am Isa Marie McIntyre with Farmer Veteran Coalition. Long Beach, okay. The mountains of East Tennessee. Oh, my favorite place, actually. Alaska. Wow, I've been there too. It's beautiful up there. Um, looks like Connecticut, Maine, Vegas. I love Vegas. Fort Benning, North Carolina. I lived in North Carolina quite some time. I was stationed at Fort Bragg over in Vietnam. Mm, Virginia. McGuire Air Force Base, uh, Fort Campbell, Fort Worth, Texas, wonderful. Illinois, quite a few people joining us. As I let a few more people come on in, I am just going to um, quickly introduce um, those of us who are on the webinar. Um, we have, from Farmer Veteran Coalition, we have Diego. He is with our communications team. We have Nick, he is our Director of Fund Development. Um, we have Kim Harris from AgriLogic. Diego, uh, I'm sorry, I already said Diego. <laughs> Ethan from AgriLogic and Tom as well from AgriLogic. And they will be here um, to discuss um, some crop insurance with us. Really important information. Just some housekeeping, um, this is being recorded. Uh, you will have access to the recording afterward. I will send an email, follow-up email, so you will get the recording. Um, you can feel free to continue to talk to each other in the chat. We really want this to be a communication, you know, not only with our panelists, but also with each other. So please feel free to talk to each other in the chat. If you have a question, please put that in the question um, box. So if you look on your screen, you should see a section that says Q&A. If you have a question, it's best to put it in there. Um, we are expecting quite a few participants today. So if you don't want your question to get missed or overlooked, um, please put it in the Q&A. Um, and then uh, we'll have our team go through those questions as we go through the presentation. All right, I think I'm gonna go ahead and get on started. Um, just kind of a brief agenda so you know what we're talking about today. I am going to share a little bit about Farmer Veteran Coalition, what we do here, how we support veterans, and then our AgriLogic team is going to talk um, about the, the real reason why you're here, get a little bit of information about um, crop insurance. And um, it'll just be an overview, so um, we're not diving in deep, although we do have a series of webinars and in-person workshops uh, across the country that will dive a little bit deeper into um, maybe answer some of the questions that you have. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get on started. Let me, okay, so like I like I said, I am Issa Marie, I'm here with Farmer Veteran Coalition. I am the grants manager. Uh, I am also an army veteran. I served in the army for eight and a half years. I joined at the uh, young age of 17, right out of high school. And I joined to work on a multiple launch rocket systems. So the MLRS, if you have no idea what that is, neither did I, so don't worry, you're not alone. It is that little piece of equipment that you see me sitting on in that photo right there. I also did uh, multiple deployments when I was in the army. I did uh, two deployments to Iraq. I drove convoys in Ramadi, Baghdad, and Fallujah, um, received a combat action badge after coming under direct fire. That was a lot of fun. I met my husband in Iraq as well. He uh, was a paratrooper in 82nd Airborne Division at Fort Bragg, um, as you can see from that photo. Unfortunately, he lost both of his legs in Afghanistan, um, but he turned to beekeeping to find a new purpose. So that's how I came across Farmer Veteran Coalition. I was a member. I joined Farmer Veteran Coalition as a member, and I was looking for resources for my husband who, um, like I said, found that new purpose in beekeeping. So very happy to be here. Um, I understand where y'all are coming from. We're, you know, we're farmers too, and we're veterans too. Um, we're fortunate enough to do some legislative advocacy in Washington, D.C. on behalf of 
veterans and caregivers. So very happy for that opportunity. And this is my little family uh, located again here in uh, Woodland, California. If you're familiar with beekeeping, um, if, you're, if you're doing it for pollination, Woodland, California is a place to be. There's a lot of almond orchards out here. So um, the majority of the bees across the country find their way to uh, Northern California during the pollination season. So very happy to be here with you all and I appreciate you all joining us. A little bit about Farmer Veteran Coalition. Um, hopefully you all are members. You can be a member even if you're not a veteran. Um, so hopefully you are members. Uh, but if you're not and you wanna know a little bit more about what we do, um, here you go. We are a national nonprofit. We've been around for uh, more than 13 years now. And we really operate on two primary beliefs. One being that veterans possess um, the unique skills and character needed to strengthen rural communities. So all of those skills that you gain being in the military, you know, being resilient, things like that, those are all necessary to uh, really strengthen the rural community. But in addition to that, and certainly in my own personal case, um, agriculture offers new purpose and opportunity, and of course, uh, physical and psychological benefits to the veterans. Now, we say that knowing that ag isn't easy. So whenever we say that, we don't mean to say, oh yes, you know, being a farmer is great, it's easy, you're just gonna make a ton of money and come join us over here. Um, we know that that's not the case. We know that there are challenges and we are here to support you um, when you experience those challenges. So we are a membership organization. Uh, membership is entirely free. There are no membership dues or application fees or annual fees or anything like that. Um, we have over 36,000 members. I actually checked our database uh, this morning. And we have over 36,000 members in all 50 states. And the reason why that's important to you is because I, I'm kind of jumping the gun a little bit. We'll get into it here in a minute. But we have members in your area who maybe they're um, raising cattle and you're interested in raising cattle and you need a mentor. We can connect you with people in your area. Um, and there's multiple ways to do that that I'll talk about here in a minute. So getting into what we do here at Farmer Veteran Coalition, we offer what we call membership support. And a lot of times what that looks like is we'll receive a phone call or an email and I'll share our phone number and our email address with you all um, after this. Or if Diego, if maybe one of you, Diego or Nick, if you can pop that in the chat. We receive phone calls and emails every day from veterans who, you know, maybe they already own their farm business and, you know, they, they own, they have bees and a wildfire came through and wiped out 40 beehives. Um, that's a real story that happened to my husband. Uh, we, we get phone calls like, hey, what do I do? You know, how, is there any programs that can help me? The answer is yes, we can refer you to USDA programs such as ELAP that can help you with that cost of losing you know, maybe half your 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 bees to a wildfire. Um, it also looks like, you know, I'm a transitioning veteran. I might want to get an ag. I don't really know if I want to be involved in ag. What does that look like? And we can kind of talk you through. Um, we have a careers and ag guide that we can kind of show you, hey, these are the different types of careers because you don't necessarily have to be on a tractor out in a field to be a farmer. You know, there's like ag tech, there's a lot, there's a big um, push for ag tech. So we can kind of show you if you wanna be a drone operator, what that might look like in ag. Um, in addition to that, we have training and education opportunities, things like what you're experiencing right now. We, we're doing a series of webinars coming up in the next year, um, talking about financial literacy, how to understand your, um, your financial statements and what to do with that information, crop insurance. Uh, we have several webinars in the pipeline. If you want to stay in tune with what webinars we have, become a member. Um, there's no fee. You might as well become a member. If you're not a veteran, you can become a, an associate member, and then you'll get email notifications for when we do webinars and workshops in your area. But we also offer membership discounts. So if you've ever bought a tractor, you know that that's an expensive uh, purchase. I know because we have. Um, we actually have a partnership with Kubota, among other partners as well, but we have a partnership with Kubota. You can get a couple hundred dollars off a of tractor. And so, you know, when you're starting up, every little bit helps, um, but we have a number of other membership discount partners. And if you want that information, you just email our support team and, you know, they'll verify that you're a member and they'll send you that information. 
in addition, we have our chapters. Um, if you're curious, if you have a state chapter, we can definitely connect you. If you do have a state chapter, we can connect you with um, the members of that chapter. But our chapters really bring this national movement down to the local level because beekeeping in Northern California is much different from beekeeping in Minnesota. So, you know, while it's great to maybe connect with a beekeeper that's not in your area, it's probably more beneficial if you are connecting with members who are experiencing the same things that you are, you know, geographically. So we definitely have our state chapters. We have quite a few in the pipeline, um, but we already have quite a few established. So if you want to know how to connect with your um, state chapter, please feel free to reach out and we will definitely get you connected. Our fellowship fund. So if you don't know about our fellowship fund and you own a farm business, you need to pay attention. Our fellowship fund is open right now. The application period is open. It closes on February 14th. So this is a grant, not a loan. You don't pay it back. It's a grant up to $5,000 to purchase a piece of equipment or some supplies that really will help grow your farm business. Um, we've given out nearly $4 million to over 930 veterans over the past um, couple of years with this program. We're very appreciative of our partners, one of them being Kubota. Again, we have a Gear to Give program that is done through the Fellowship Fund, where we actually give out five pieces of equipment per year to farmer veterans. So if you don't want to make that big purchase of purchasing a Kubota, you can absolutely apply for our Fellowship Fund, and there's a section on there for Gear to Give. Again, that application period closes February 14th, so, you know, Give your honey something they're really gonna like and apply for a tractor with our fellowship fund. All right, our homegrown by heroes. So if you look at the photo on your screen, you will see on the A carton in the back, there's a little homegrown by heroes label right there. Our homegrown by heroes label is the official farmer veteran brand of America. It actually certifies that the product is grown by a veteran and it allows um, consumers to just support the veteran community by purchasing, you know, products that are grown by veterans. We have a new partnership with Market Maker. So our homegrown by hero veterans, they can actually um, participate in the Market Maker where it just provides like an online opportunity to market your product. Um, if you are a homegrown by heroes uh, member and you are interested to know more about Market Maker, just give us your information in chat and we'll connect you with our HBH program manager. But we have over 2,700 homegrown by hero producers in all 50 states. And we represent over $50 million of gross annual sales with our homegrown by heroes label. So if you grow your own, if you produce your own product and you're not homegrown by heroes certified, um, definitely get homegrown by heroes certified. All right, that's um, the end for my session right here. Again, here is our support email and our phone number. We do have a new 1-800 uh, number that we can put in the chat so you all can call that as well. But I'm very happy to turn it on over to Ethan from the AgriLogic team who will go ahead and hop into the, the good stuff. Well, thank you, Isa Marie. And I, I'm going to tag team this with Kim Harris while I get uh, the slides shared. Uh, Kim, you wanna fire away and get us started? Sure. Well, good morning, everybody. We really appreciate you joining us for this. And you know, as uh, the the information went out, you probably received my bio, and and I will have to apologize. I am kind of recovering from a little bout with strep and pneumonia, so I have very little wind capacity. So Ethan has graciously offered to step in and do the presentation, so I don't annoy you the whole time. Uh, more than qualified, he's very instrumental. We tag teamed on this presentation, so he's very familiar with it. I would like to say this. This um, uh, organization and this opportunity to serve in this organization is very near and dear to my heart. I don't know if you can see my dad's flag there in the background. I have three nephews who have served or are currently serving with multiple tours to Iraq. You, as you might mention to your husband, one of them was part of the 82nd. And my youngest son was a part of the 101st. So of course we had that battle going about back and forth, which was better. He's currently on his way to Guantanamo Bay to serve uh, nine months there. So this project and this organization is really near, <clears throat> excuse me, near and dear to my heart. So um, call, I'm talking from the west coast of Illinois, so you can hear the Midwest twang. But for the next for the next 60 minutes or how, <clears throat> however long we have here, 
Um, you're going to get to hear Ethan's delightful New Mexico twang. It is New Mexico, right, Ethan? Texas, Texas. Texas. Okay. For some reason, I was thinking your family was, I know you're in Texas, but I wasn't sure if your family was from New Mexico or Texas. Uh, hop, hop, skipping the jump from there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, oh, thank you, Kim. And, and Kim will come in. Um, like I said, Kim, y'all have read her bio and she's had a ton of experience in the crop insurance world. And so she'll step in uh, where needed. And, and, and whenever I whenever I send us down a feeder road, she'll make sure we get back on the highway. And uh, like I said, and, and interject what Kim said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you again for your service. Uh, those those that are veterans or, or in active military, thank you again. My grandfather was a uh, MP in the in the Korean War. And, and like I said, I, I greatly appreciate the men and women who fight for our freedom every day and, and just want to I know y'all don't get thanked enough. And so I, I want to just start off saying that. And it's near and dear in my heart as well. But like I said, a um, little bit about, like I said, th thank you for all who are attending and, and thank you to the Farmer Veteran Coalition, the great resource that we have in, in them. Guys, use them as much as you can. It's been a pleasure to work with them throughout this project. We also have Tom Blinn as well with us. Uh, Tom's our operations manager uh, with Minuteman Weather and AgriLogic. He, he helps with the coordinating and, and making sure we stay in line with this event as well. And then, like I said, um, we all pretty much had the other housekeeping activities on, on answering, you know, sending questions through the Q&A. We've received some of your questions as well and hope to answer those at the end if we have some time. If not, and, and we see necessary, we might, we'll send out an email uh, talking about some of those different answers. Uh, just crop insurance, there's a lot of technicalities, and, and as we'll learn, I'll preface to get started with this, that there, there's some exceptions. Rule, world uh, Rule number three, it always depends on different things, and so it's a make sure, like I said, we'll, we'll answer those that we can, and then those that require a little more of a technical answer, we'll make sure to get those sent out and sent back to, to Farmer Veteran Coalition to make sure everybody gets the answers, questions answered. Uh, like what Kim said, y'all may not know a whole lot about me. I grew up in West Texas, West Central Texas, south of Abilene. Uh, we grew up on a family farm and ranch operation, fifth generation farmer here, and still st stick my nose in it as much as I can. I grew up on a, like I said, we farm wheat, cotton, a little bit of corn when it rains, sunflowers, and some grain sorghum. And then we run uh, Angus Cross and shorthorn, uh, purebred shorthorn cattle out there. And, and like I said, grew up. Love doing the agricultural industry. Came to Texas A&M University, uh, pursued a bachelor's degree in animal science, and then a master's in business, and then started working for AgriLogic in 2020, and have about two and a half years of working here with them. And then also beforehand, I worked at USDA ARS with uh, cotton research and development, working on researching different how how we can improve the cotton genetics, and then also did personal property and fleet management. Uh, a little later and then joined the AgriLogic team. Uh, I'm also an auctioneer, so I apologize if I talk a little on the fast side sometimes. And it's kind of like what we say, sometimes we've got a, a long way to go and a short time to get there. But I hope in the next hour that we have that uh, you provide and have some great information that we can, uh, I thought there was a great response or a comment somebody made about uh, it's knowledge equals empowerment as how I think it was worded. And I really think there's a lot of truth to that. The more you know, uh, the better it is. And, and hopefully we can provide you with a lot of great information as you're thinking about starting to farm and ranch, or if you're thinking, or if you're um, in farming and ranching right now, maybe we can provide you some information that'll help down the road. So Ethan, I'm just impressed you were, you were able to work in a Smoking the Bandit reference there. I think you're old <laughs> enough to know that. Exactly. We, we'll try to incorporate as much as we can to keep it entertaining and interactive, most definitely. So you may ask, who is AgriLogic Consulting? So we're an economic and insurance consulting firm, primarily uh, working in the agricultural industry. We are based in College Station, Texas, uh, at, on Texas A&M University campus. When you look, we have uh, Kim is up in Illinois, and we have uh, several other staff members that are in Florida and, and Kansas in a lot of different places across the country. And so when you combine all that experience over 250 years of combined experience, and then our main primary deal is the research and development of crop insurance programs uh, to help the agricultural producers. So we're looking at the public side and the private side on, on developing different programs to, to help 
uh, give the agricultural producer the, the, the things that he needs and the, hopefully the risk management tools he could use to mitigate and face all the challenges that we face in farming and ranching. Issa Marie hit on the Farmer Veteran Coalition. Like I said, again, great resource. It, it's a great opportunity. I would encourage you to join if you're a member, if you're not a member yet, if you're a member, keep you, you know the benefits that the Farmer Veteran Coalition has. And then our other partners are the USDA Risk Management Agency. I'm not 100% sure if, if Bill or Chola is on the call today, but we'd like to thank them also for helping uh, coordinate all these different activities and, and the funding is in partnership with the USDA and you can see the contract information there. So when we get started talking about risk, so big overhead 30,000 foot approach to this is what is risk? Give you a perfect example. I was thinking about it this morning. I woke up and, and uh, turned, on the, turned on the light switch and electricity came out, light showed up but there was a risk involved that I can turn on the switch and there's no electricity. I go and fix breakfast and, and get my coffee in the morning because my wife tells me I'm a little grouchy before my coffee. And so there is a risk involved that, that uh, my mood it, it could, could correlate with what that coffee pot does on a given morning. And then, like I said, of course, eating food, you don't, they're, they're, you make sure it's cooked right because there's risk of foodborne illness and everything else that can be associated with that. I get in my vehicle to come to work here at AgriLogic and there's a risk of my vehicle breaking down or uh, some, some other crazy college student um, running into me or, or whatever the case may be. So there's a risk associated with that. I walk into the office and, and get ready to go to work, turn on my computer. Well, guess what? At least my computer turned on running, but there's a risk that it, it didn't work and I might have to go to our IT guy or figure something out. Internet works, there's a risk of that. Uh, give you a location. We're about three miles from the uh, College Station Airport, and then we're also about three miles the other direction uh, from a railroad that goes to Houston. There's a chance that something happens to a plane and and crashes right into our building. Uh, there's a risk that train, uh, you know, a train gets off the tracks. There, everything that we deal in life, as you can tell and and think about, has some sort of a risk involved. So when we look at that definition it's the, really the possibility that something bad is going to happen in the future. So there is a risk involved that, like I said, probably a real low risk when we start thinking about, you know, something happened to a plane and it crashed into the building and something wild happens. But we also see this on the five o'clock news almost on a daily basis as well as these wild occurrences that can, that can happen. Now we're gonna dive into, and when we start thinking about on the farming side of things, Really in farming and as Kim and Tom and myself can tell you and, and also Issa Marie and Nick and some of the others that are involved in the farming operations, it's not really a matter of if an event's going to happen, but when. There's a lot of different situations that come up. My great grandfather, he was a big uh, cattle guy and he always said, if you don't want to lose them, you don't really need to own them because you have them long enough, you're going to run run the risk and you're more than likely going to lose one or two eventually down the road and, and probably more than that. And so when we talk about how risky of a business farming is, it's, I will say on, on behalf, another great comment is that farming is one of the greatest things that we can do, farming and ranching, uh, provide the feed, food and fuel for this country and for the world. And we know how bad, it, we're trying to make sure everybody has a, a good meal that they can eat. And farming is in agricultural industry is a huge part of that. So the two sectors that we have in, in the risk of farming, we have the damage to, to persons or property. I can tell you, and Kim as well can probably tell you many, many stories about, well, my, we had a cow get out and got on the highway. And, and uh, usually, thankfully, uh, 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 I guess in one breath, say thankfully, a, a big 18-wheeler hits the cow and kills the cow and does more damage to the cow than, than the person. But you think about if a car hits them, there's there's a lot of risk involved in that. Uh, hazardous materials, a, a tornado coming and, and tearing up your, your farming or ranching operation. Then, then there's the loss of income as well. We have on the financial side, you think about the loss of markets or increasing production costs, as we all know today. All that we see these last few years and in this upcoming year, I mean, we're looking at fertilizer prices almost doubled or tripled. Uh, chemical prices have doubled, the, the increasing production costs and, and that inflation word that we use, um, significant 
that can it can hurt that bottom line of that producer. We have the loss of markets. Like I said, all it takes is all it takes is a, a celebrity or, or a research study to come out and say that um, tomato tomatoes can cause cancer and have a 80% chance of causing cancer. Well, that just really tank the, the tomato market. And so you have there, there's that risk involved. There's the price decline. As we know, with the pandemic that we were faced with, prices tanked. Um, and then crop production failure as well. All it takes is one good hurricane or one good hailstorm to come. And uh, instead of instead of making 500 pounds, you're making 200 pounds or you, it may totally, totally devastate your crop and, and you don't make anything. So there's a lot of different risk involved that we can see. Um, what can we really control? You know, there, when we start looking at it, sometimes it, it, it just happens. We do the best we can, you know, talking about the cow getting out. We, we check our fences and try to make sure there's plenty of grass that incentivizes that cow to stay inside, uh, inside the fence line. But, but sometimes the grass is always greener on the other side, it seems like. And, and that's kind of the same way with loss of markets. We really can't control a lot of that. Um, we do the best we can, and, and that's why I always say, and you'll hear me say again, rule number four, hope for the best, expect the worst. Um, but there is, when we start looking at like price declines, those last two, price declines and crop production failure, those are two things that we can control that we'll talk a little more about. So when we're looking at risk, and, and we can bring up these different examples again, the two main components that we're looking at or how frequent or how often is this event going to happen? And then how bad is that, how bad is that event going to be? So give you a perfect example, about two weeks ago, my, I have a Chevrolet 1500 half ton pickup and uh, it just didn't sound right. And so check engine light came on around that same time too. And I said, I better take it to the mechanic before, before something worse happens to it or, or before I get stranded, take it to the mechanic and it's a fuel pump and about, it, it always seems like about $2,700 later, we, we get the truck out and it runs like a top. And about two weeks later, it starts kind of sounding funny again. And, and the air air and the fan and all that was, was acting up. And uh, well, the thermostat went out on it. So there's another $800. Well, you know, there is a chance that it was, maybe it was a sensor. Well, that sensor may cost $20 versus that fuel pump is $2,700. So how, how bad is that event going to be? And then, like I said, we've had in the last month, I've had the truck truck go down on me twice. If it if it keeps up the pace, it, it, we may be going to the dealership with it. Um, and that kind of goes back to the same thing on the farming side. How often is this event going to happen? Are we going to see uh, droughts occur all the time or, or how bad are these droughts going to be? Um, a lot of different elements that we have in those components. And so we go back to that big million dollar question. Well, how do I reduce my operations risk? Can I reduce the frequency of those events happening or can I reduce the severity? You know, we, we bring up that question of kind of talking about the cow example. Uh, can, I, can I reduce the frequency? Yes, I can fix the fence because if I don't fix the fence, she's gonna to continue to get out every day. Or, or maybe if she's a, what, what I would call a Houdini and, and wants to get out all the time, uh, she may need to go to the cell barn to, to reduce that frequency. And then, and then, like I said, the severity, well, uh, you, you try the best you can, maybe instead of, maybe it's a small hole and one cow gets out, but if it gets bigger, maybe 20 cows get out. So when we start looking at that on the crop side of things, can I control what that, what that hurricane's going to do when, when Hurricane Harvey comes that we experienced in 2017? Can I say, oh, Hur Hurricane Harvey, don't, stop, stop. No, I, I, I really can't. I don't have that control over that. And uh, how, how bad is it going to be? Is it going to be a tropical storm or is it going to be a category five hurricane? And so there's really, when we start looking at these naturally occurring events, we, we really can't control what, what those events are going to do or what magnitude they're going to be. But what we can control is we can transfer a part of the risk that we have in our crops or our livestock and we can transfer that to someone else, which in crop insurance, we're going to talk about being, being the insurance provider or the approved insurance provider. And so we think about auto, you know, auto insurance is a perfect example. Um, it's, it is a requirement, but I'm transferring that risk that if I get in an accident, it's not all on me. It's uh, the insurance company hopefully will, will come into play on that given different circumstances and technicalities to that. So transferring that risk, like I said, this presentation, we're going to focus on how can we manage our risk, mitigate it uh, on 
to help save our income or, or provide a safety net uh, that will help us uh, through, and like I said, mitigate that risk by using crop insurance. And so we go into what is a crop insurance policy? Well, it's, it's a contract between you and that insurance company, and you're going to pay a you're going to pay a fee for this for this risk transfer element to it. Uh, that for a fee, you're going to transfer that risk to the company, and that company is going to protect your operation uh, against some of your losses. What are those losses? Is it due to yield loss? Due to due to decline in price? We'll talk a little more about that here shortly. And like I said, it's basically covering these against naturally occurring perils that are beyond our control. So we're going to talk a little more about that, but hurricanes, tornadoes, um, hail, drought, a lot of these, uh, blizzard, winter storm, a lot of these different elements that are naturally occurring that, that, can, uh, that can happen during the insurance period or during the growing season. And so when we start looking at it, we're talking about this crop insurance and the, the generality of it. So we're all faced with kind of a question in, in, in the crop insurance world or as a producer, do I want to insure my crop or do I not want to insure it? And there's pros and cons to both sides of it. What I want to remind you, and Kim said this great, uh, she's, whenever she was training me on this, she, she said it perfectly. Really everyone in theory has crop insurance. It's do I transfer that risk to an insurance company to mitigate that, or do I hold all the risk on my own? And so when you look at the pros and cons, well, if I hold all the risk and I do not elect crop insurance or use a uh, insurance provider, the, the best thing is, is I don't have to owe a fee. I don't have to pay anything. Every, every dollar I make, I make, and I don't even have to worry about the, the added premium cost or the cost it takes to to pull out a crop insurance policy. And then all the paperwork that goes on with that as well. We can, we can talk about all the odds and ends and making sure your T's are crossed and I's are dotted, but uh, there's, there's, you alleviate that. However, whenever, you know, if you have 100% of your crop, there's a chance that you lose all of it, all 100% of it, or there's a chance that, you know, you only lose 20% of it or 10% or you don't lose any of your crop uh, that's that's the risk that you're taking on your own where in crop insurance yes you're going to have to pay a fee you're going to have to pay a, a little bit of a premium there's going to be some paperwork involved but the nice thing is is that you're capped at a certain so and we'll talk a little more about coverage level but if 100 percent of my crop and i elect a 75 percent coverage level that's insuring 75 percent of my production if i lose 60 percent 50 percent uh, if excuse yeah excuse me if you, if I lose fifty percent or sixty percent of that loss, I'm the worst I can do is twenty five percent of of loss is is what I'm holding, and then seventy five percent of that risk is going to that crop insurance company if that makes sense. And so really the the million dollar question becomes when you're when you're debating both sides of the fence, wh what is it that's going to make you sleep at night and sleep peacefully? Uh, we we talk about mental stress and and. Everyone, everyone I bet on this call understands the, the mentality that there is. What, what is it going to, going to make you sleep at night? If, if you can go to bed and say, man, if, if I lose it all, it'll be okay. Um, maybe that no insurance is a possibility, but, but if you sit there going, man, if I, if I lose it all, I'm in big trouble. Uh, that crop insurance is sure going to help you out. And like I said, help you sleep at night, have that peace of mind. And then like I said, uh, we we're talking about lending, difficulty borrowing money. Um, ag lenders and, and bankers really in, in enjoy making sure that that risk is mitigated by using um, crop insurance. And, and make, like I said, that, that ag loan or operating loan is a lot easier to, to approve whenever you know that there's some risk tools that that producer is using. So the two different types of crop insurance programs, we have the federal side, uh, pu public or what we call the federal multi peril crop insurance. A program and then there's privately developed policies. So on the multi peril for the on the federal side, typically all those policies are, are multiple perils, and we'll go into a little more of, of the multi perils now that since the federal crop insurance program has expanded so much, there are some policies that are more of a single peril. It's it's covering rainfall or a, a different metric like that. Uh, however, for the most part generality and, and like I said, an overview, it's, it's multi peril for most of those policies. They're administered by private insurance companies. 
um, that have an agreement with the federal government to administer those policies. But all these programs are backed by the federal government and they have a premium subsidy involved as well that we'll talk a little more about that helps the producer out tremendously. On the private side, we're going to mainly focus more on this presentation on the federal side. On the private side, uh, it mainly is at more of a one peril policy. Uh, hell insurance for, for crops are a huge one that we talk about a lot. And they're de developed and administered by private insurance companies who, who sell typically sell on the federal side as well. And then they're not backed by the federal government, but uh, these insurance companies have to approve and go through the regulation process on a state level basis typically and make sure that not any games are being played and they're not trying to take advantage of the producer. And then, of course, uh, being not backed by the federal government, there's not usually premium subsidy or there's not any federal premium subsidies involved on the private side. So our objectives today, we're going to explore the use of federal crop insurance and, and how that reduces and helps you reduce your risk of, of losing your income. We hope that we give that 30,000 view of, uh, foot approach of, of an overview of the federal crop insurance program, the little bit of history about it and how it operates. We hope that we give you a basic understanding of the different policies and then also uh, hitting on those benefits that uh, specifically veterans that you all have um, through the crop insurance program. And then we're going to kind of talk about different levels and, and more of the common policies that we see and uh, the different crops that they cover. So you kind of have a good idea of, of what may fit your operation. That's the beauty part about today is that we have a large, large demographic uh, from what it looked like. I, I think the information that we saw, it's like we're covering 40 states and, and a lot of different areas as y'all all popped up on the chat, that there's a lot of different, a lot of different operations and, and everything from everything from Christmas trees to livestock to bees to Florida culture to nursery to row crops, a lot of different aspects. And so instead of trying to dive into the weeds on each one, we're going to kind of give you that 30,000 foot approach on, on a high level review of all these different types and kinds of policies that we see in the federal crop insurance program. And Ethan, here's a, a point that I kind of like to interject is one thing that you will find with crop insurance is it is different depending upon where you're at, what crop you're growing, and there is no way that you could do a presentation on everything. Um, so as you'll learn, there's depending upon where you live and what you're growing, the answer is different than somebody across the country. So um, <clears throat> we can't get down into the actual weeds of each and every one, um, but that's what crop insurance agents for, are for. And Ethan will kind of cover that here in a little bit. Absolutely, absolutely, great point. So we'll give you a quick review of, of crop insurance history. Uh, I, I'm not the biggest history fan, but, but it is good to understand where, where we started and where we're going. So in 1880, uh, the, some tobacco farmers in Connecticut, I know Connecticut, I believe, was the fifth state um, inducted into the union and or ratified into the union. That's the correct terminology. And, and they were the first, that the farmers from that state were the first ones that come up with the idea of crop insurance and, and developed a company to insure hail damage and on, on their tobacco operations. Then we fast forward about 50 years later, in the 1930s, we had this thing called the Great Depression that I think most of us know about in, in the Dust Bowl. And that really showed how, how vulnerable our agricultural industry was in this, in this great country. And so we figured out that we needed a need for it. And so in 1938, the Congress approved for the Federal Crop Insurance Corporation. We'll talk more about what they do and then also establish the first multi parallel crop insurance program and uh, more on a kind of a pilot basis, see how it goes and, and understand and, and get it structured right to hopefully expand. And it definitely took off. And in 1980, we see that the Federal Crop Insurance Act passed by Congress expanded to more programs, more crops and more regions and really made crop insurance more prevalent in our country. Going to 1994, uh, Congress approved the Federal Crop Insurance Reform Act, which discounted premiums and created what we call cat coverage or catastrophic coverage. It uh, basically gave the opportunity, the, the biggest issue was 
back in from 1980 till 94 is that we saw that rates were so high and it was it was almost costing the farmer more to insure his crop than time we talk about that risk it it cost too much to apply for insurance he just carried the carried the risk himself and so in 94 they figured out a way to discount those premiums and, and create a cat coverage um, to become available two years later uh, rma was created to help administer the Federal Crop Insurance Corporation and also start educational programs, such as a program that we're putting on today on the educational aspect of, of risk management. In 98, the private insurance companies were authorized to sell and service all federal multi peril crop insurance programs. And really, the as private companies can get things done usually a little quicker and, uh, and at, a, at a faster rate, and so to use that efficiency, like I said, the federal government saw the, the opportunity and the advantage of incorporating the private companies into the realm of crop insurance. Two years later in 2000, the Agricultural Risk Protection Act was passed by Congress. And that basically expanded the private company's role and in, in implemented the research and development of new programs and gave that responsibility to the private companies. Agrologic Consulting, we, we do a lot of this research and development. And this is where uh, we we kind of come into play is um, we have programs and different ideas from from different organizations come and, and we do the a lot of development. There's other companies as well um, that work in the research development of new programs to help improve the the offerings that federal crop insurance has. Congress in 2014 passed the Agricultural Act that basically made crop insurance a cornerstone of ag policy and, and saw the significance and really established that, like I said, as the cornerstone to ag policy and to mitigating risk. In 2018, we had the 2018 Farm Bill or also known as the Agricultural Improvement Act, which mainly focused on specialty crops and then also found these benefits that our beginning farmers and ranchers and our veteran farmers and ranchers now have. And we'll touch on that here shortly. So then the big question becomes, what, what are we at today in crop insurance? So today's multi peril crop insurance program on the federal side, we're looking at 1.2 million policies earning premium. When you look at that at an acre or tree or, or colony basis, you know, we're looking at right under half a million or half a, excuse me, yes, half a million, uh, half of 500, right below 500 million, if I can get my words together right, a little less than 500 million uh, insured acres. And then on a tree basis, we're looking at 77 million trees. When we look at that on a liability basis, that we're we're protecting over 173.4 billion dollars in liability. And when you look at that at a crop basis, corn and soybeans are the main the main element into this liability calculation. And then wheat, cotton, and then pasture rangeland and forage are, are kind of tail off the top five. But corn and soybeans are the big are the are the big crops that that push and move a lot of the crop insurance field. But then as you can see down the line, it gets a lot closer depending on different years. And, and like I said, this is 2022 information, um, but a lot of different crops and a lot of different offerings that, that the federal program has. So the entities in federal crop insurance, we have USDA Risk Management Agency or, or known as RMA. I do apologize that in, in crop insurance, we have a lot of acronyms and so it, it takes a little bit to, to understand the different acronyms that we have and, and throw out. And we'll try to do the best to make sure we use those uh, appropriately. I was going to say, um, most of the people on this call are military. They're acronym based anyhow, yeah. right? It's a, <laughs> you guys live and die by the acronym, so you can feel right at home in crop insurance. Yes, welcome. Exactly. Welcome on board. It's, it's the same concept. <laughs> the same concept. And so we have a risk management agency, and like I said, they help the Federal Crop Insurance Corporation and then also do risk management education programs such as the one that, that we're doing today. Then we have our private approved insurance providers, or we call them AIPs. And that contract that we talked about is a contract between federal government, FCIC board, or FCIC and, and RMA, and the AIPs. And there's two different agreements. One's the standard reinsurance agreement or SRA. And then we have the livestock price reinsurance agreement, LPRA. 
not really a whole lot to know about those that we could, that we don't want to get into the weeds on that. But basically, that's an agreement between the two, um, understanding how we're going to how the insurance providers and the federal government are going to relate with one another and how they're going to make sure that that insurance policies are administered appropriately. Then that leaves us with a with a crop insurance agent that most of us as farmers and ranchers or producers and growers we're going to be involved with is that crop insurance agent. And the big thing to highlight is that the insurance agent is working for the insurance provider, those AIPs. And they also, for, the, for a good insurance agent is, we'll reiterate on, and I know Kim will probably highlight as well throughout the presentation, a good insurance agent is gonna make sure that, that all parties involved um, are benefiting and, and doing everything appropriately and, and making sure that insurance is provided at the best possible way for the producer and the provider. But the crop insurance agent is working for the insurance providers. They have a contract and that contract explains the relationship similar to the SRA and LPRA. And so we'll highlight these again, USDA, RMA and the FCIC board, go ahead. Oh, sorry about that. I thought I heard, heard somebody go through there. Um, RMA and the FCIC board, probably the best way to explain this, it's a little bit of a difficult understanding, but I look at it kind of like how we have a school board and a superintendent. The FCIC boards, that school board that's approving uh, new insurance plans or any modifications to existing plans. It's a board of directors. A lot of members on the board are farmers and producers in various areas. One has to be a specialty crop producer. And then also um, agency and then reinsurance are also uh, represented by the board of directors. And then the RMA, like I said, that's more of that, that superintendent role in administration. They do the, the everyday, day by day basis of making sure that crop insurance is improving and, and broadening that availability and uh, also working with the FCIC board. And, and then of course that educational aspect, putting on programs and resources for those producers and, and people in rural communities and such as what we're talking about today for, for veteran farmers and ranchers. We have our AIPs, our crop insurance agents, and then our producers, uh, farmers and ranchers. Of course, producers, farmers, and ranchers are pretty, pretty easy to explain. It's you guys that are, that are out on the field and, and going through the challenges of everyday life. The insurance agent, as we talk about again, a representative for that insurance company. And through whenever they sell a policy, they're going to receive a, a little bit of compensation through selling those for the insurance providers. And then the AIPs have that agreement with the federal government, with RMA, and then they, they do the, a lot of the administering of these policies. And this would be a, a, good point, a good point to start. Every company signs the same exact agreement and agrees to the same rules, regulations, et cetera. So if you have a let's say a, a, a apiculture or bee policy with one company, it's the exact same company or policy as with another company. So all, there are no differences in the programs. The programs are, that are published by the risk management agency and these companies are agreeing to abide by those rules and regulations and have no authority to change them. So every company, every agent, they're all on the same playing fields. Uh, and they all have the same set of rules. So it's not like your car insurance where <clears throat> one company has this um, little uh, rider on it and the other has this little perk on it. Um, every, every agent is representing a company that is operating under the same rules as, as the company down the road. So always important to remember for you that there's, uh, you know, it doesn't matter which company you choose, the rules are always the same on that. Yes, even playing field, even playing field. And so really, and, and we'll highlight this also, as Kim mentioned, it's the, a good insurance agent is, is going to have the heart of a teacher, I, I like to say, and they're going to make sure that the, A, the producer knows what they're getting through these different policies and, and that customer service and that relationship is really more or less the, the competition, I guess, among agents versus trying to say, oh, well, this is a lower rate because everybody's on the same playing field. Everybody has the same rate for the same type of policy. On if federal policy. So on, I on, federal clarify, policy. on federal. On federal on policy. Private, not the same, but on federal, yeah. And, and, and you know, and Ethan mentioned, you know, that the, the agents are representatives of the company. And, you know, I 
stress that to him when we were kind of going through this, but what you'll probably find is those agents are really out to serve you because um, they're the people that are in your in your community um, that you know. And so th their goal is to make sure that you get the best product that you can while staying within the rules. So a good agent, I've trained agent, was, was an agent, trained agents for many years. A good agent is worth their weight in gold. So Exactly, exactly. So we'll dive into the, the the actual policy, the multi peril crop insurance policy. So that's the contract between you, the insured, and the AIP, approved insurance provider, that does that transfer of risk that we've talked about. And it's very important to make sure that if I'm about to market my, if I'm about to market, if I grow grapes, and I'm about to market my grapes as Ethan Bredemeyer then I need to make sure that my name on that policy is Ethan Bredemeyer. But if, if Kim and I are partners on this deal and we run KE, KE Farm and Ranch or, or KE Grapes, and we're about to market that as KE Grapes, you need to make sure that that entity is, in, is on the policy. That's a very important um, concept to, to understand is it's however you're really selling that commodity. And contracts are, are typically on a single crop basis. If I insure wheat and cotton and, and corn, um, there may be, I'm, or in, in that same, you know, if I, excuse me, if I do corn, wheat and cotton, and uh, those may have the same policy number due to simplicity for AIP reasons, they are still three separate policies. If that makes sense, they're just using that same policy number to, to locate, all right, well, you know, my policy number is one, two, three on corn. It'll probably be one, two, three on wheat as well. Just that commodity is going to change. And then um, insurance is available where the actuarial documents are available. So another big thing to highlight is that not all programs for all commodities are located in all areas. Um, we tr they, most policies for the most part are, are, you know, most cotton is produced in the, in the Southeast area and Southwest. And so that's where you see your cotton policies at. Um, there's usually not, you know, they, I don't know how much cotton is really grown in Alaska, um, for an example, but, but probably cotton is not available in Alaska if I'm, if I'm guessing on that right. But there are written agreements. Um, you need to have four years of production records. Basically, that's showing that you can successfully produce that crop in that area that you're at. And so there is a way of written agreements that you can use. However, like I said, for the most part, they do... I would say most programs do a good job on if you typically raise crops in that area, you can usually, there's usually a program available for it. But like I said, exceptions do apply. So you must be uh, apply for coverage by the sales closing date. You'll hear that term used a bunch, the SCD or, or sales closing date for the initial year. Upon acceptance by the insurance provider, of course that policy is issued out. And uh, there might be typically on our perennial crops or tree crops, there are sometimes an inspection. You fill out a, a, pre, uh, a producer accept or pre acceptance worksheet, and then the insurance company will come out and do an inspection um, and make sure that you can successfully grow it and there's trees and it's not, not something real wild or, or something that, like I said, you can, you can actually produce that crop more or less is what that inspection is for. Policies are continuous from year to year. This is an important thing that if I produce, if I produce olives, well, olives are, I, I may not use that one as a, as a good example. There's, there's some differences to that, but if I produce a citrus in, in South Texas and in one year, you know, I did it, I was successful for the 2023 crop year, uh, went through my policy. If I do not cancel that policy, it's going to renew the next year. So unless I go in and say, hey, I'm, I'm not going to produce it anymore, or I decided I don't, uh, I do not need crop insurance, um, you need to go in there and make sure you cancel that or it's going to continue to renew on a year to year basis. And then, uh, of course, if I want to change, we'll talk about coverage levels, but if I want to, if I insured 60% of my production and the next year I want to produce or uh, insure 85%, I need to make sure before that sales closing date that I get that done and, and contact my agent to make sure I do the, do the things necessary to make sure I bump that coverage up. So the policy cycle, kind of the, the establishment coverage is those 
one through four, RMA publishes this graphic and did a, I think this is a great way to look at it. You have your application renewal um, by that sales closing date. And then, and then of course, acceptance of the policy and then insurance attaches um, as soon as you have that policy accepted. Then we kind of have our finalization of coverage, you could say, your summary of coverage. You submit your acreage report. So if I, by sales closing, I elected uh, wheat, for example. By acreage reporting, I'm going to turn in my acres, say I had 200 acres. And then they're going to, the insurance companies, I'm going to get that summary of coverage that shows how much premium I owe, what I'm insured, kind of that general summary of what type of insurance I, I have at the end of the day. And then of course, there'll, there'll be premium billing and then in the claims process, if that wheat uh, had a dry year and, and my wheat uh, suffered a loss, I would apply or send a, submit a notice of damage or loss. And then usually an adjuster from that insurance company will come out and, and make sure that I did have a loss. And then they'll do the calculations and the work and make sure that indemnity claim is processed and I receive a payment if, if I had that loss. And then of course, by the contract change date, um, that's going back to that next year, it basically restarts the whole cycle again. Uh, that contract change date is, is pretty much when all the final policies for the next year have to be finalized. So I can look at that policy and, and see if there's any changes or modifications to that. So important dates, we'll highlight some of these. Sales closing, we've talked about that. We've talked about cancellation. Acreage reporting date, that's basically the date that I have to re, uh, submit my report and say I planted 200 acres of wheat or I had, um, I'm insuring or I have 500 trees, uh, 500 almond trees or, or pecan trees or something like that. Um, that's when I have to submit how much I have. Premium billing date is the earliest date that that insurance provider can bill you um, for the premium that you owe. So they can't, can, they can't ask for your money any earlier than that. That's the earliest date that they can bill you. Uh, the end of insurance date, of course, that's going to when your coverage ends for that crop year. And then termination date, really all that is, is if I, if I don't pay my premium, uh, that's, that's the date that the insurance provider has to terminate my policy and say, hey, uh, Ethan's, not, Ethan's not submitting his premium. He's, he's a lost cause. We need to, we need to terminate this policy because he's, he's breaching it um, because he's not paying that premium due. Insured perils, of course, the biggest thing to highlight, go back to that, it depends, and, and there are exceptions. Not all perils are applicable to all crops, but we can see there's a, there's a long list. It's basically naturally occurring events that can happen um, that are not man-made. So, and we can go, there's like a lot of different details, um, but like I said, it's hard, to, it's hard to stop a hailstorm or a hurricane from hitting. Um, but if somebody runs over to my crop and ignites it on fire, well, that's a little more man-made. And so there's a lot of different provisions in place to make sure that we're really focused on those naturally occurring events. So premium and administrative fee, there is a fee whenever you do a policy for buy-up coverages where it's about 30, it's $30 uh, per crop per county. On the catastrophic coverage or what we call cat coverage, it's We'll talk more about coverage level, but it's basically covering 50%. Uh, you have a 50% coverage level at a 55% of the price. And uh, we, we, you can look into that a little more and we'll talk a little more about that. Um, but the nice thing about CAC coverage is it's subsidized at 100%. So all you owe is that $655 administrative fee. Uh, the federal government is paying for that premium through the subsidy program. Now, beginning veteran or beginning or veteran farmers and ranchers, you're exempt from these administrative fees. So essentially, if you're a beginning or if you're a veteran farmer and rancher, you can elect cat coverage pretty much for free because they waive that administrative fee. And then, of course, with the subsidy at 100 um, percent, that's that's good, good opportunity for you. The only problem that I will say is, is catastrophic coverage is pretty much what it is. Um, it's for when those catastrophic events occur. And that's probably about what it's going to cover for the most part. Premium is calculated on a, a liability basis. And then uh, we have that subsidy factor that we'll talk about. And then as Kim mentioned again, and we can iterate, it doesn't matter who you go through, what agent you go through, the premium rates are going to be the same for the same policies. Everybody's on the same playing field. So going to subsidies, premium subsidies are um, varied by insurance plan and unit structure. The most important thing 
If you're interested in, in thinking about doing crop insurance, go see your, your local FSA office and make sure you get this AD 1026 completed. It is a, a Kim could iterate a little more on this, but basically it makes sure that you're gonna follow these different regulations for, for wetland conservation, or if you have like highly erodible land that you make sure that you're not, if, if you have land that's on a slope, you're gonna make sure that that land doesn't, you're, you're gonna do the best management practices you can and make sure that you don't cause a cause a problem or, or like I said, on the wetland side, you're not farming on wetland. We wanna make sure we conserve our, our wetlands. Yeah, so I had to give Ethan a little lesson on what a highly erodible land was being he from West Texas where we have quite a bit here on our farm, highly erodible. What they've done is they've tied conservation compliance with, with subsidies. So if you do not comply on the FSA side with conservation compliance, if you're out of compliance there, you lose your subsidy. You can still insure, <laughs> insure your crop, but it's going to cost you more. So they here several years ago, they tied those two together. The AD 1026 form is basically a form that says either I do or don't have highly erodible or wetlands. And I, you know, I'm going to go buy that. So they can they can walk you through that. It's not something um, that you have to figure out yourself. The, the FSA office knows where they are, et cetera. It's just important that you go down and visit and get that done so that you don't miss out on subsidy. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the nice thing as well, when we start talking about this premium subsidy, uh, if you're a beginning vet farmer, excuse me, if you're a beginning farmer or rancher, or if you're a veteran farmer and rancher, you receive an additional 10% of premium subsidy. And so we'll dive into that. What, what are we looking at? So here's our different coverage levels. We'll have another slide that highlights this, but coverage levels typically range from 50 to 85% and 5% increments. And then we have our cat coverage as well. So this is a standard. It, it all depends. Every, every program's a little different on premium subsidies, but this is kind of a good standard rule that we can, we can use um, on the different coverage levels. So, and we'll run through an example, but essentially as I have highlighted here, if you elect 65% coverage level, you're going to receive a 59% subsidy. And then you're going to, your, your per share in the premium is 41%. So self-explanatory 65% coverage level, there's a 59% subsidy. If the total premium that you owe is $100, the insured is going to pay $41 and that other $59 is, is covered through the subsidy program. So it's a great benefit. Again, as we talk about on the, on the veteran side, if you're a veteran farmer and rancher and, a, and qualify for that, you get a 51%, uh, you get a 51%, excuse me, you get a 69% subsidy. And so you're going to only have to pay $31. So that's a, that's a huge, huge benefit that we have. Qualifications for veteran farmer and rancher. Uh, the, the biggest thing is, of course, you, you were in active duty um, and become a veteran, and you either A, have not operated a farm and ranch. If you have operated a farm and ranch, it can't be for less than five years. But even if it is more than five years, if you obtained your veteran status during the most recent five-year period, uh, you still qualify for that, for this veteran farmer and rancher benefit. What are the benefits to this? You're exempt from, from those administrative fees that we talked about on your CAT or your buy-up coverage policies. There's an additional 10% premium if we, as we've highlighted. There's an opportunity that you can use the, a good example of this, I guess, on using a previous producer's production history. If my, if I'm a, if I, or if an individual uh, worked with his dad and was active in, in the farming operation and then joined the military and then became a veteran and wanted to take back over the operation uh, and his, his dad starting to, to, to want to retire from, from farming, I guess, he can use that same production history on that same acreage as long as all parties involved are, are approved of that and as long as you were active in that operation. And then we'll talk, there's a little bit of a yield adjustment. This gets a little complicated, but but essentially, and we won't dive into the weeds here, but instead of a 60% uh, replacement of a lower yield, so you had a really bad year and uh, you, you, we can, there's a yield adjustment that's gonna substitute that bad year um, at a T yield, which is basically a conservative um, area, that, area yield that these programs produce out 
Um, instead of 60%, we're gonna look at 80%. And then of course, if you're a business entity, um, that's okay as well. You can still obtain the veteran status as long as all in, uh, members of that entity uh, qualify as a veteran farmer and rancher, but your spouse. Um, so if, if it's my spouse and, and I, as long as I qualify as a veteran farmer and rancher, um, that's good as well. The spouse is, is exempt uh, from that. Beginning farmer and rancher, basically it's the same exact benefits on the, that we saw on the veteran side. Uh, the difference here is, is you, you basically cannot have operated a farm and ranch for more than five years. Uh, whole farm revenue protection is, is no more than 10. They're going to be excluded, uh, of course, these crop years. So Kim gave a perfect example yesterday on this. If, if I'm 16 years old and I, I start my farm and, uh, you know, 16, 17 and 18, well, whenever I'm 19 years old, that doesn't count as three crop years. Um, I'm, those years since I'm less than 18 years old are excluded. Um, now, if I continue producing for, like I said, more than five years um, after that, so I farm at 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Now, whenever I'm starting to turn 23, 24, I cannot qualify. Also, uh, post-secondary studies and in active duty as well um, are, are exempt from these crop year calculations. And then same thing as businesses, as long as all are, are qualifying as a beginning or a veteran farmer and rancher, uh, that, that is good for this benefit. Limited resource farmer and rancher, we will not, uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this, but essentially if, if you meet these thresholds, uh, we, the USDA will help uh, waive those administrative fees that you're faced with. And so help give you some assistance through that. If you need to look at the determination tool, uh, USDA has a great limited resource farmer and rancher determination tool that you can use to see if you qualify. And like I said, basically if you qualify for that, they waive those administrative fees. Coverage level, uh, the percentage hey, of- Ethan, yes, uh, you wanna, can we take just a little quick break here and kind of catch up on a few questions just to give you a little bit of a break there and kind of get ahead of just a few of them. We've got quite a few here. So absolutely I'm just going to kind of go down through um, a few of the questions here. Um, as I find them here by Mrs. Miss yours, I do apologize if I miss it. Um, private crop insurance for industrial hemp. Yes, there are companies out there that do offer private crop insurance for industrial hemp. And there is also a federal program for industrial hemp. So um, both of those, uh, there is, there is, uh, there are programs out there for for hemp at this time. Um, as a matter of fact, Agrologic Consulting was the developer of um, industrial hemp. When I started the industrial hemp project, my hair was auburn red. Um, so, uh, um, let's see, uh, Alaska. Yeah, no, there's no cotton peanuts, etc. I do know that we did an education <laughs> program in Alaska, and we were in contact with some agents at that time. So perhaps, you know, we can help is in them locate some agents there um, in general or help direct somebody towards that. Um, as far as Rutledge, Missouri, uh, that is not very far from my house. And they used to have a fantastic flea market there. Kind of interested in those 132 acres because our deer hunting was terrible this year. But for some reason, we're stuck here in Illinois. Anyhow, um, let's see. Let's start here at the beginning of these. Uh, commercial cut flower growers. Um, we'll be looking at the whole farm policy. So we're gonna be answering some questions on whole farm revenue. Um, so if that doesn't answer your questions, we can go into more detail on that. Uh, livestock available for laying hens with avian flu at this time, there is not any um, insurance policy that covers avian flu from a federal crop insurance program. That doesn't say that there's not a private one out there somewhere or um, something along that line. But at this point in time, there is not in the feder on the federal side. Um, also for timber, there is not a crop federal crop insurance program that I am aware of that covers timber. Uh, if you are a landowner that only has a third of the share in the crop, are you eligible for in crop insurance? Yes, as long as you own a percentage of the crop, you are eligible for crop insurance. You will just be insuring only your share. So. For example, if I and my tenant um, have a 50-50 share arrangement, when I take out my crop insurance policy, I will be insuring the whole, 
all the calculations will be on what happened on that acre, those acres, but it will be multiplied by 50%, my share in it. He also could take out his policy, but he might do it at a different coverage level, a different plan, et cetera. So we're independent of each other when you do crop share, as long as you own um, a piece of that crop. As far as AgriLogic selling insurance, no, we're just a consulting company and the developers on the backside, um, we do not sell or service crop insurance policies. Um, our goal is to just do our best to make the best policies out there that are available. And the question was, is there insurance to protect against foodborne illness that originates from product off the farm? And no, at this time there is not um, almost all crop insurance policies. There is one, <laughs> One thing about crop insurance you'll know is there's always an exception to everything. So just always keep that in mind. Um, <clears throat> but for the most part, there are not any kind of policies that cover it once the crop is harvested. Typically insurance ends on all policies at harvest. So, um, so we talked about the avian bird flu loss. Unfortunately, no, there is not a policy in place. Although that might be something that we want to put on our radar. Um, coverage for a maple farm. Um, I, uh, there is not currently a syrup policy, another uh, thought that uh, maybe we need to be looking at, but the whole farm revenue protection policy would also be a, a fit for that. How much cropland do you need to get insurance? It depends on the policies. Most majority of the policies do not have a minimum um, crop in, uh, regulations. Now, for example, industrial hemp does have some acreage minimums, so it just depends on the crop and where you're at in the world. Um, I'm not sure I understand this question. So we are selecting based on premium. Um, when you're looking at what covered, <coughs> coverage level to buy, you need to be looking at number one, what you can afford. You know, everybody wants the best coverage that they can buy, but also that may not be what they can afford. So you're gonna have to weigh what the coverage level is versus, to, versus what you feel like you can afford, just like you do your car insurance, et cetera, you may increase your deductible or whatever to try to make that fit within your operation. And there are on a lot of these policies, there are a lot of different tools and ways that you can do that to change your premium. Again, where a good agent will be able to come in and help you. Yeah, Kim, that, that question came in when Ethan was talking about uh, all all uh, AIP selling the exact same policy. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. So it's really sort of the distinction of having a good agent. Yes. Yes. So if you have one agent giving you a quote that is $15 an acre and another one saying it's $16 an acre, they're not quoting the same thing. You know, they're using, they have a variable that's different because if they're quoting exactly the same variables, your approved yield, your coverage level, you know, uh, the area where your land is located, et cetera, they will come up with the same premium. So um, and you will not be selecting your agent based on who has the best premium ever. You will select your coverage levels, maybe on, <clears throat> on premium, but not the agent or the company themselves. Exactly. What recourse is available when I encounter a bad agent who is very uncooperative? Find another agent. I mean, an agent's job is to teach you how crop insurance works, to make sure you have the best coverage that you can get, that the policy is working well for you. Um, and if you've got an agent that it's not working, then it's time to find another agent. Um, I hate to say that. I've trained agents for many, many, many years. A good agent makes a whole difference. Talk to neighbors, talk to um, FSA, talk to anybody you can talk to in the ag business and ask them who they use, why they like them, what they are, you know. And then when you sit down to, to talk to an agent about, you know, covering me, you know, ask them questions. You're interviewing them because you are not bound to a single agent or company, there's no benefit other than their service. Service is all they have, is what they have to sell. So um, crop focused. So when we talk about crop, when we say the word crop, we don't necessarily mean those things that have roots. We also have apiary, which, um, well, apiary, I'm thinking apiculture, um, but crop does not always mean something with roots. We, there are policies for um, cattle, uh, sheep, pigs, uh, bees. Um, so, and we're gonna get into, a, Ethan's just getting ready to head down that road. Um, so when, when we use the term crop or commodity, it does not, well, and even clams. So it does not always mean a 
a, a growing plant with roots. Um, let's see. And on the veteran five years of farmings, um, I'm going to need to, we'll probably need to get a little more information on that before we answer that question because um, that there's several different directions that could go. So um, we'll probably have to, Eric will probably need to um, get a little more information on that one. Um, trees that produce truffles. At this point, I don't know of any individualized policies, but again, whole farm revenue protection um, might be uh, a good fit for that. Um, where are we at? It just switched on me. Somebody answered, added a question and I lost, there we go. Minimum numbers, years of farming to get covered. The majority of the policies do not require previous experience to start farming. There are a few. Um, industrial hemp, for sure, is the one that I know of, requires one year of experience growing the crop, but the majority, the vast majority, do not require previous experience. Limited partnerships between brothers, um, <clears throat> how would it be insured? Um, if it is an, a, a setup as a limited partnership, then you would want, and you sell the crop as um, two brothers uh, partnership, then that's how the policy would be set up. And you'll list each of the brothers as what they call a substantial beneficiary interest on that policy. So um, it, it kind of depends on how you, I always tell, I always tell growers how you can sell the crop. You know, when I get a settlement sheet or uh, uh, where you, the documentation where you sold the crop, what's the name that's gonna be on it? What name are you certifying at FSA? You need to make sure all these things line up so that the entity that's being insured is the entity that's selling the crop. Exactly. So, um, and, and that is very critical because a, a mistake in setting up your policy could cost you on the backside in the claim. So it's just very critical that you are really clear with your agent who's selling the crop, who all is involved. Um, if you're a spouse, if you have a spouse, it's very critical that you get your spouse's name and social security number on the policy as well. Even if they don't have anything to do with the operation, they have to be on there, so. Um, and then base crop election affect insurance. And what if I don't plant that crop? Um, <clears throat> oh, PLC and ARC. So PLC and ARC are both FSA programs. And there are some uh, ties between PLC or ARC and some of the crop insurance programs. So that's something that your agent will need to explain to you if you have this then it will limit possibly your SEO coverage, things along that line. As far as planting the crop, so if you take out a crop insurance policy and you're planning on planting, let's say 20 acres of sugar beets and something happens that you don't end up planting those sugar beets and you switch to another crop or, you don't, or the deal falls through or whatever, you owe no premium and no admin fees. No premium or admin fee is incurred until the first acre is planted or the first until um, the first, um, to your acreage report is turned in showing what you're insuring. So if you have no interest in a crop and crop being livestock or whatever, if you have no interest in any, then you owe no premium. So I think, oh, that gave me all, oh, nope, there's a few more. Um, is a policy premium higher if you have far, less farming experience? No, it does not look at how many years you've farmed and how experienced you are. Um, a first year farmer will pay the same premium based on elections, et cetera, as somebody who's been farming for 20 years. What if your bearing years for a crop are starting this year for trees like walnuts, almonds, et cetera? How do you show forager production for the first year viability? So Ethan <coughs> mentioned the, um, the transitional yields, county transitional yields. If you don't have four years of history, then there are can, county transitional years that will be plugged in yields that will be plugged in for those four years that you don't have um, you don't have uh, production. So there are some tools available for those. Like you said, they're just now coming into production. And you don't have any history. <laughs> there are, are tools there available for that. So um, I think that got through all of our questions there, and we'll go ahead and let let you get back to it, Ethan, because. That's about the end for me. <laughs> perfect timing. Perfect timing. No, that sounds great. Yes, keep the questions coming. And we're we're about 
We're a little more than halfway down. I think we're going to roll through some of this as well. We might be pushing on that two o'clock, Issa Marie, just a little bit, but we'll we'll try to fly, fly, but still get be effective as possible. So on coverage levels, we've talked about this a, a pretty good amount as well. So I think we've kind of highlighted this. If your yield is 10 pounds an acre and the price that we have is a or that RMA established, depending on what the program is, is a dollar a pound and you have 100 acres, you're looking at your total crop value is $1,000. So if I elect the 75% coverage level, I'm insuring $750 of my crop value. And then that deductible, we hear about deductible and in health insurance and some of those is $250. I think that's pretty uh, self-explanatory. And like I said, 75%, your deductible is 25% of that. So plans of insurance, we're going to highlight some of these and we'll go through a quick, a uh, couple of quick calculations. But as we can tell, there's tons of different types as we've highlighted and, and there's a lot of time to go into the different weeds about different programs and the, and the different elements that they have. But basically we can summarize them in four different categories. We have our individual base coverages. So that's focused on your operation, your yield, your revenue. There's area based that are based on, all right, well, what are my neighbors doing? I may have a loss or I may not have a loss, but everybody else in my area might have a loss. So we all get a payment on that. Or if I just have a loss, I may not get paid because everybody else did good. In between those two, we have that hybrid kind of a quasi area and individual based programs. And then we have our parametric index. I think Kim highlighted on this as well with, with uh, PRF and then uh, Ap bees apiculture as well. So this is just a, a brief list. This is page one of the different types of programs that are available. Like I said, we'll try to highlight different ones. And as we can see, here's page two of the different programs that are available. A lot of different options. And, and like I said, uh, we, we wish we could go through each one of them and go through, but every operation is different. And so a lot of different opportunities and availabilities. When we look at it on a liability side, side this RP that you see that's big, uh, revenue protection, that's your corn, your soybeans, and we'll highlight those as well. But when we're looking at insured liability, that's, that's the big components of those. We see a lot of liability in APH. Um, and then YP and, and then that those rainfall indexes are, are where you really see the big the big nodes at. When we look at it on a unit basis, of course, that AQDOL that you see there, that's a number of clams. That's a clam policy. So as we all know, there's a lot of clams in, in, a, in a production atmosphere. So that's why you see that number so inflated. Uh, we see rainfall index and then, of course, RP are both the next two high ones. Uh, we see the rainfall index, there's a lot of acres, but as, as we say, you know, that one acre of grass isn't uh, quite worth quite as much as that acre of corn is. So actual production history, it only covers yield losses. There's not a decline in price, just yield losses based on those naturally occurring events. It's based on your most recent four to 10 year average. So kind of like what we were talking about in transitional yields are typically available. So if I've produced it for four years, and I've averaged 25 uh, pounds uh, an acre. That's what my yield's going to, my average yield's going to be. Uh, producer elects a percentage of their approved yield to insure, going back to that coverage level. And then loss of production is, is based on that RMA established price. Usually these prices are, they look back at what has it done historically, the prices, and then try to forecast it for that upcoming year is what RMA tries to do on that. As we can see, APH crops by far, there's a lot of different options um, from almonds to plums to walnuts to triticale, covers a lot of people across the board. So how, how does this work? How is this example? So we're gonna use an approved yield of 1600 pounds. 1600 pounds an acre is, is what, I'm, uh, what I typically average four to 10 year average. I like the 75% coverage level and I have hundred acres. My established price is $2 a pound. When you multiply that all together, my guarantee is $240,000. Well, I had some naturally occurring events happen, had you know, a excessive wind um, hit and, and caused my production to loss or, or a drought, whatever the case may be, naturally occurring event, and I only produced 100,000 pounds that year. Well, I'm gonna still multiply that by that same $2 a pound established price 
and my production account for that year is two hundred thousand dollars. So I'm going to take my guarantee, two hundred forty thousand minus my two hundred thousand of what I actually produced, multiplied by my share, and I receive a forty thousand dollar indemnity. So that's how kind of a good. This is a good baseline on how a lot of the other different programs work. Um, this is a great calculation step to, to really understand how the calculation works on the on the backside after after a naturally occurring event happened. So yield production, we only cover yield losses. It's exactly pretty much when we start looking at these, it's exactly like your APH programs. The difference is where does that price? So we talked about RMA establishing prices or um, and, and trying to do the forecast on those in the yield protection policies. We're looking at the either Chicago Board of Trade or uh, Intercontinental Exchange. You've probably heard of CME or the CBOT or, or ICE, ICE. Um, it's based on those future futures markets. So corn, we have a futures market in it. And there's a price discovery periods as we have here for projected and harvest. And basically we're looking at on yield protection, we're looking at that projected price discovery period. And as we see, a lot of the row crops are, are what we see in the YP programs. Quick YP wheat example. So like I said, almost the exact same way as our APH programs go. We have a 40 bushel yield, 75% coverage level, 250 acres. My projected price is $8.79 a bushel. I'm looking at a guarantee of a little less than $66,000. I only produced 2,500 bushels that year due to a hurricane or a drought, whatever the case may be, still multiply that by that same projected price. And I have a right under a $22,000 production account. So whenever you do the math on that, I'm receiving an indemnity payment right under $44,000. Revenue protection and revenue protection with harvest price exclusion, we're starting to get a little more complicated on this, but it's really pretty easy for the most part um, we're looking now at a price component instead of yield, instead of only yield that we see in YP and AP, uh, APH programs. Same thing, we're looking at our row crops uh, for the most part that we have these. Usually if you have a YP program, you got a RP, 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 HPE. So loss of revenue uh, or a decrease in price that we see, um, you, you notice that harvest price element. So there's a projected price and then an end of season or harvest price. And so the difference between RP and RP HPE as we'll go into a, an example is if my projected price is $8 and 50 cents a bushel and my harvest price goes down, both programs work the exact same. If the price stayed the same, then both programs are pretty much like our YP and APH programs because there's no difference in price. But if my harvest price goes above my projected price, so I started at 850 and I go to 950, my revenue protection program, the RP policy, is going to use the $9 for my guarantee and look at my yield versus the RP HPE, harvest price exclusion, excludes the harvest price. So when I'm looking at my guarantee, it's just going to use the projected price, even though my harvest price is higher. And we'll go into an example and talk a little more about that. Um, but essentially, kind of the way to look at it, in that scenario, when the harvest price is higher, at the end of the day, whenever I'm harvesting my crop, I may have a yield loss, but because the price is higher, it all kind of balances out at the end of the day. Where my RP program, it's going to account for that higher harvest price, and it's actually going to look at my loss of yield and kind of not worry about the, the inflated price to that. So as we talk about these, these examples, if the harvest price is less than the projected price, so we see uh, 200 bushels of, uh, we can say corn, 85% coverage level, 150 acres at a $5.90 projected price, we're looking at $150,000 of guarantee. If that price decreases, we're gonna use that harvest price because that's a decline in price. And so my production account, I only produced 22,500 uh, bushels, I'm looking at $129,000 uh, production account. When we look at that on an indemnity basis, we're looking right at a $21,000 indemnity. So now what happens on the RP side, 
if my harvest price is greater than the projected. So same example, but our harvest price was uh, increased to $6.50. So now in my guarantee, I'm looking at, I'm using that $6.50 value versus the former $5.90. So it's gonna increase my guarantee to 165,000. We see the same uh, production loss and we use that harvest price. So we, it accounts for that decrease in yield. And we're looking at a, nine, a little less than $20,000 indemnity. Now, if I elected the HPE side of this, even though my harvest price is greater, my projected price, I'm still gonna use that to calculate my guarantee. It excludes the harvest price, which is that harvest price exclusion element to it. So $150,000 is my guarantee. I did have a loss in yield, but because the price increased, my production to count's going to increase. So now instead of in the former, when we had a $19,500 indemnity, in the same scenario, I'm only receiving $4,200 because it's calculating for that harvest price inflation. We'll go through these pretty pretty hard and fast because I know we're, we're almost ex we're exceeding our time a little bit. Um, but margin protection, so we're looking at what is the revenue and then minus those input costs. And we see those a lot on the row crop side as well. And so it's more on the area side. What is the area? They're not really based on what are your inputs and your revenue, but what is the area doing? And if, if the cost increase or your revenue decreases, there's gonna be a payment um, in between those and it, it protects your margin. Pretty self-explanatory there. On the area side, area programs were very similar to what we just went through, except instead of your individual policy, we're talking about everybody um, in your, typically in your county. Um, so it's not necessarily on your operation. That goes back to the same thing that I may have a loss, but if everybody else did not have a loss, I'm probably not going to receive a payment. Um, but if I, if, if everybody receives uh, has a loss and I do not, um, I still may receive a payment at the end of the day. It's based on that area. Dollar plans are a little more uh, complicated, but they're kind of that quasi individual area base. So what is it taking to produce that crop in that area is how they're looking at that price element. And then if you have an event happen and a adjuster goes out there, well, you lost 25%. So if it takes $100 to produce the crop, you got a 25% loss, it's going to pay you that $25. Is if, if I said that correctly, Kim, make sure I'm on the right track on, on that side. But that's kind of how the dollar plan works is it's the prices are established on the area um, and then an event happens. And then, like I said, it depends on what percent of the loss we're looking at um, on an individual basis. Tree-based dollar plans are almost the exact same, except we're looking on the tree side of things. There's a tree reference price. So as we know, it takes longer for to, to get back to that five-year-old tree. So if I have an uh, orchard with, with five-year-old trees versus an orchard with, or maybe let's say an orchard with 10-year-old trees versus an orchard with two-year-old trees, that reference price on those 10-year-old trees is going to be higher because it's going to take a longer time to get, if an event happens, it takes a longer time to get that tree from the ground to 10 years old versus the ground to three years old. And we see that, of course, in, in the tree programs. And then we have a grapevine program coming in as well that we know about. That won't really look on a percentage basis. It'll be if it's destroyed or if it's not destroyed, um, the prices will be um, assessed as appropriate. I'm not gonna go into much detail on these two programs because they're so specified, but um, it is available on, on revenue history and, and in production and revenue history plans and, and those given areas for strawberries and oranges and cherries. Um, best thing to do on these is contact your, contact your agent if, you're, if this looks interesting to you. Um, it's based on the guarantee of, of your revenue or of your revenue in your production. Rainfall index, I know Kim highlighted a lot of this one. The biggest thing to take home with this is that you have to let their, their two month interval. So January, February, February, March, March, April, you must elect at least two of these intervals. So I have to in the one month, so I can't elect January, February, and then February, March. They, the months can't, what's the right term, overlap. So I can elect January, February, and then I can elect March and April. And so 
we're looking at that. You have to elect two of those two month intervals. And it is the biggest thing to highlight on this is it is not based on, well, I got five inches on my property or I hadn't received, you know, I only received half an inch. Well, your area may receive two inches. It's based on the, the data gathered and obtained by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration or, or NOAA as we know in the Climate Prediction Center. That is what's triggering this rainfall index. It does a great job, but like I said, we all know how weather, how weather can get wonky and um, right down the road, it can rain an inch and a half and only in your place, it's half an inch. So have that understanding that it's based on NOAA data. And like I said, this is available for your annual forage, uh, PRF, pasture range land and forage, and then our, our B producers can elect this as well. And I wanted to kind of interrupt here too. We had had a question about fodder and um, by fodder, I'm going to assume that we're talking um, silex or something along that line, but the annual forage part of this covers annual forages that you, uh, like this uh, sorghum grasses, et cetera, that you plant every year. Uh, whereas the PRS, PRF, pasture, rangeland, and forest, um, ba forage basically covers perennials. Um, so <clears throat> all of these crops, what they have in common is rainfall, even bees, um, the rainfall affects the, the health of the, um, of the colony. And same thing with these forages uh, and pasture, et cetera. So you're ensuring rainfall because it has a direct impact on the health of your crop, whether it's exactly. bees or, yeah. So if you're a beekeeper, this policy works really well. And is I know, I think you said that you guys uh, carry, uh, and it's not too hard to administer. It goes by colonies. Um, anything you want to add on, on that from your experience with, with the apiculture? Yeah, we actually do not have insurance. Um, we do have 1,500 hives here in Northern California. It's something I've been beating my husband over the head about, but <laughs> okay. we do not. Okay, all right, apologize for that. I thought you said that you had, so. Um, but yeah, it, it does a good job of, of helping to offset some of those losses on that. Again, it's, it's not uh, uh, where the, the colony dies out, what's the word, of mortality insurance. It's basically rainfall, um, the, the rainfall values, you pick, you show where your area is and the rainfall values, they don't just pick one weather station, there's multiples. And so they're fairly representative. And the other difference between this product and all the others is you're not insuring the whole growing season. So if I'm insuring my grapes, I'm insuring from the time that they first bud till the time that I harvest them, or is this I may be ensuring the January, February timeframe and the May, June timeframe when my crop, where my pasture, when my whatever I feel is most vulnerable and you can pick is, you know, more than two. So anyhow, just a quick one on that one. This one's a really popular plan, especially in the, in the pasture areas. Exactly. And as we saw that PRF, this is that PRF falls in this rainfall index. And that's, that's one of your, your big top, in, in liability that we're looking at. Very popular program, great program. We use it as well in, in running cattle out there. And so that kind of dives us into a good transition talking about livestock. They're mainly the policies that we have out right now uh, that the federal government and the programs have right now, livestock risk protection uh, for fed cattle, feeder cattle and swine, livestock gross margin and in dairy revenue. They are ensuring declines in price. So. They're looking at the futures contracts and, and where the swings go from there. Gross margin is similar to that margin protection that we that we highlighted that's looking at the margin, so your revenue minus your, your input cost. There is a program coming out um, in 2024 that will have a yield concept to this. It'll be more like those RP programs that we talked about in row crops. Uh, that will be for cow-calf producers on, on your wean calves. And so uh, it'll, be, it'll be coming soon that'll have a yield uh, component to it. So we'll have to modify this slide before too long. Um, but this is right now that the available programs for this year, we're looking at those that that price decline, basically, that we're looking at, whether you're looking at fed cattle, uh, feeder cattle, hogs, or if we're looking at on the milk side of things as well on your dairy revenue. Dairy revenue has really been, a, I think, a, a really popular program as well for those guys. And, and these programs are really starting to, to um, a lot of people in the livestock guys are really taking over and see the need for, for risk management on, on their livestock. 
All right, whole farm, we're going to highlight this one. And then I promise we're, we're pretty much done after whole farm. So it's a safety net for all your commodities in the farm under one insurance policy. I, I don't know if you want to say umbrella policy, um, but one insurance policy across all your commodities. It adds basically all the revenue that you're putting together in those different commodities and then determining if there's a loss occurred or not. If you want to qualify for this, it's it's up to $17 million in insured revenue. So the thing to highlight on this is that insured revenue. So if you're producing, for example, like we have here, if you produce out of all your commodities, you're producing $34 million of approved revenue, you can elect the 50% coverage level and you're insuring 17 million in insured revenue. So that 17 million is your insured revenue. So that's your, whatever you're bringing in times your coverage level. And if you exceed that, you cannot qualify. But if you're below those thresholds, this is a, this is a really, really good program. Uh, it covers revenue across all commodities and um, except for timber, forestry, and then like your livestock show animals or, or your dogs and cats. I, I don't think we can insure your dogs and cats under this policy. Um, but like I said, any, pretty much all the commodities on the farm except for timber or your or your show animals or, or sporting events or exhibitions and, and then pets as well. Uh, the biggest other limit as well is that insured revenue. I did look this up last night. Um, animal and animal products and then greenhouse and nursery, you're limited to that $2 million in insured revenue um, on that aspect of, of whole farm. And kind of just some history on this, this product. This is kind of designed, it, it actually, there was a, a, a precursor of this program um, that was out and they kind of did a lot of modifications and um, increased the effectiveness of this program. The whole focus of this program is for those crops that are not row crops, um, specialty crops where there's not a policy available. Um, for example, for up until recently, Clary Sage was not available. There wasn't a policy available, but recently now one has come out, but you could insure it. Um, if you're growing um, just specialty crops that are not insurable under other policies, this gives you a, a, a way of insuring those. For example, there's not a, a, um, a uh, goat insurance policy, things along that line, or different types of berries. So um, it, it just puts in place a policy where you can ensure agricultural revenue um, that falls outside of what's currently available, which doesn't mean, and Ethan will explain this here in a minute, but doesn't mean you can't carry other policies too. It's just, it's designed to try to catch those specialty growers, the smaller growers, and, and especially the, especially specialty growers um, is what it's geared towards. So. Exactly, exactly. And so similar to what Kim, Kim alluded to, I can have a, for example, I can have a, a hemp policy, but still have whole farm um, as well. And any indemnities that's paid on that hemp policy is going to add to my production account for my whole farm. So if I receive a $40,000 indemnity on hemp, uh, that's going to apply to that production account for whole farm. And so it also provides replant coverage, um, except for hemp and those covered by another federal policy. And that we can dive a little bit into that if, if interested. But um, basically, if there's another policy that has the replant coverage, we're, we're trying to not double coverage. That's the biggest thing on federal crop insurance is there's no double coverage where you're getting paid twice under the, for the same dollar. Um, so essentially, like I said, if there's a replant payment on on a crop and you have whole farm with it, that, that individual policy is what's working on your replant side of it. Uh, insurance period is your calendar year. So Jan 1 to December 31st, unless you go by physical year. And if you go by physical year on your taxes, um, that's, it's whatever that case may be. If it's October 1 to, to September 30th, uh, there's your physical year. However, your physical year is structured. So, your guarantee that we talk about, if we go back to that, if you think back on the APH calculation, so your guarantee or what we call your approved revenue is either your expected revenue or it is your whole farm historic average revenue, which is the last five years 
of your Schedule F or whatever uh, other tax forms that you have for your farmer ranch. Uh, beginning farmer and, and veteran farmer, you only have to provide three years of that. And so it's whichever one the lower is of those two. It's, of course, your approved revenue and then times your coverage level is your guarantee or your insured revenue. Sam similar concept, 50 to 85% coverage levels. And then we'll highlight this a little more, but 80 to 85% coverage levels are only available if your commodity count is, is three or more. So here's the sales dates for that. It's important to know in your area and, and go back to the importance of a good crop insurance agent. Uh, are you an area that's, that has a sales closing date of, for an early filer of 131 or 315? Need to make sure that you know those so you, so you, don't, you don't miss out. Causes of loss, um, pretty much kind of go back to that multi peril adverse weather, fire, um, insects, plant disease. We'll touch on those real quickly. Uh, earthquake, volcanic eruption, failure of irrigation, water supply, and wildlife. You see those little kind of comments made to the side um, and then also a decline in market price. You see a lot of those different little uh, kind of the fine lines and the fine details. It's kind of like insects and disease. If you're not doing a, if you're not doing the good farming practices and, and making sure that all right, I got bugs, I need to, I need to spray my bugs if, if necessary, or I have plant disease and need to take care of that. If you just kind of let it run rampant, um, there's some exceptions to to these causes of loss. It's all right, you know, it, um, army worm were really bad this year, so I did the best I could, but it's still going to cause damage. So those are some of the the fine lines and fine details that you have to read into when we start talking about causes of loss. Commodity count goes back to that 80 or 85 percent, and we'll talk about commodity count. It's not necessarily, I grow three crops. Uh, we'll talk about that here real shortly, but you do see that if your commodity count is higher than three, uh, you get a higher subsidy and, and much higher, and you're also allowed to elect that 80 or 85 percent coverage level. So commodity count, of course, like I said, it's not by the number of commodities, but through a calculation. So let's take the example, you produce bees, cut flowers, and pecans. And these are your, pecans or pecans, I'll, I'll, I'll accept both, both sides of how you word it. West Texas boy says pecans, but your total expected revenue is 27,000. You produce three commodities, that's very true. And so we're gonna take that total expected revenue, throw the coverage level out for right now, total expected revenue, you're gonna divide one divided by the number of commodities produced. So in this example, we have three. So we're gonna take that, so you have that calculation, which is a third, and then you're gonna multiply that by a third, which is a fixed factor. And so you're gonna get um, 0.111. You're gonna multiply that by your total expected revenue. So essentially what we're looking at is we wanna make sure that these commodities that you produce are in excess of a third of your, of your total expected revenue. So for example, in this example, we're looking at a little less than $3,000. And so bees would not count in my commodity count, but cut flowers and pecans would. So while I'm only producing three commodities, my commodity count is two. So now let's say, all right, I have my two commodity account, or uh, my commodity count is two. I cannot elect the 80 or 85% coverage level, but I elect 75%. So I'm gonna take my insured revenue, so 27, or my expected revenue, 27,000, multiply it by my coverage level, which is 75%, and that's my insured revenue, so $20,250. My revenue to count for that year between bees, cut flour, and pecans, so even though bees doesn't count as my commodity count, they still include in the whole um, of my expected revenue and revenue to count. So that's $13,250 for that year. I take the difference between my insured revenue and my revenue to count, and I'm gonna receive a $7,000 indemnity in this scenario. Micro farm is very similar. Uh, it, it basically simplifies whole farm for smaller growers. So that cap, it's uh, farms that's no more than $350,000 in approved revenue. And then for carryover at insureds, uh, they increase that to $400,000. So anything less than that qualifies as micro farm. You only have to require three years of records. Um, if you're vertically integrated or if you have other insurance policies, you do not qualify under micro farm. 
So essentially, this is a, it's like I said, the best way to summarize it is a simplified whole farm version for smaller growers. Commodity count um, we talk about is, is three for diversification to get that 80 and 85% coverage, coverage levels and those subsidies. Uh, revenue from post-production operations may be included. We're, we need to do a little more. Um, I believe this was essentially for like people who make jellies and stuff like that is where, where they put this provision in and then replant payments are not provided. So what are the last steps? Ladies and gentlemen, we, I think, I hope the biggest highlight that we've made throughout the day, as long as giving you kind of that overview of crop insurance is you need to find a good crop insurance agent. Um, we talk about, like I said, all those rates are going to be the same on the federal side. It's, it's the customer service. And, and I go back to, you need to make sure you have one that has the heart of a teacher that can show you how the policies work and, and what different options you have as a producer, as a grower, um, that will help you maximize that risk. Um, in mitigating that risk that we've talked about at the beginning of this presentation. And it's important, as I said, determine the cost, the benefits and the risk of different programs. And, and like I said, we start from the ground basis today, uh, a couple of hours ago now about, do I insure or do I not insure? All right, well, what are the costs with insurance or the benefits, what are the pros and cons and understanding what that risk and, and really essentially, what is it that's gonna make you sleep, sleep a little better at night and in a, Good resource for that is your crop insurance agent. There is RMA publishes an agent locator. Um, you can find that on the RMA website and I have the link here as well and go through that. Who are my local agents? And then Kim iterated this again and, and, and I'll emphasize it. Your local farmers, everybody, I always say everybody's in the same boat together. We're trying to provide the feed, food and, and fiber and fuel for the world. And so uh, all the farmers are a great resource and then also FSA, um, county executive directors are a great resource. Uh, a lot of different opportunities that you have and RMA has a great agent locator that you can use as well. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions, um, I will probably be the point of contact for AgriLogic. There's my contact information there and, and uh, I can work with Kim and Tom and, and some of the others that we have on our team in order to make sure that all of our all the questions you have can get answered properly. Again, the Farmer Veteran Coalition, thank you again. I know Issa Marie is probably yelling at me for going past the time. And, uh, and like I said, we, we have a lot of information. It's where you're probably drinking out of a fire hose, but hopefully we provided you with something that's valuable that you can learn. And uh, like I said, feel free to reach out if you have any questions. And thank you again for your time. I see we still have 67 participants that have listen to me forever. You'll probably be hearing <laughs> me in your sleep. But uh, again, thank you all for staying on board. And, and uh, like I said, let us know if you have any questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Ethan. And, and it has been a wonderful, um, has been a lot of information, but definitely much needed for our members. So we really appreciate the AgriLogic team for joining us. And we appreciate all of you who have um, stayed on for this long and we will send you a recording. So if you need to recap everything, you can definitely do that. Also, we will be sending a follow-up survey, um, not only to just kind of give us some feedback on this webinar, but also to let us know what other types of webinars you want to see in the future. So please um, be on the lookout for that and complete the survey. It helps us better serve you. Um, so just thank you all for being here. Thank you, the AgriLogic team. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. Yes, it's been a pleasure. Thank you all on behalf of, of AgriLogic. We thank you all for everything you do. And, and I think we'll be doing some upcoming webinars as well, hopefully with, with the group. And, and we might dive a little more in depth of, of different elements to crop insurance. Absolutely. And I do have like, is a, is a like four really quick questions. I'm just going to jump them real quick while we're here. Um, there was somebody who was planting a fruit nut orchard. Could they be covered? Depends on what fruits, what nuts, and where they're at. Um, slides, you already covered that part, whether this will be available. Um, specialty cup, crop cut flowers about nap, look at the whole farm revenue. And then raisins, the person asked about questions if raisins are insurable. And yes, they are. There's an APH program for or dollar plan program for raisins in California. So I want to catch those real quick. So those are covered. Thank you. All right. Thank you all very much. <laughs>